In this video, I'm going to be unboxing a bunch of my old engineering exams to give you an idea of what exams actually look like in engineering. I wish someone had shown me what engineering exams look like when I first started out. So in this video, I'm going to be sharing with you three of my exams. I'll show you what you can expect out of these engineering exams, what my questions look like, what my solutions look like, and I'll even share with you my grades on some of these exams if that's something you're interested in. And I'll finally show you what the overall class average was for these exams as well. Let's start off by having a look at one of my first year calculus courses. The exam came with an equation sheet in the last page of the exam that contained a bunch of important rules that are related to integrals and trig that I would need when solving the exam. Thankfully, the professor gave us all these rules on the exam, so I didn't need to memorize anything. Usually, engineering exams allow us to bring a cheat sheet or a study sheet to the exam, but this one didn't allow us. The exam was two hours long and it had about seven questions. The first page of the exam starts off by asking us to evaluate a bunch of integrals. This is a fundamental concept in engineering because a lot of upper year courses will ask you questions that require you to have a good understanding of integration. If you have no idea what an integral is, it's essentially this squiggly line right here. And I tried my best to make my work clear and concise by labeling my steps. That was question 1a. Moving on, we have question 1b, which is again a similar question where I have to evaluate the integral, but I just use a different method to do so. Next, I had to evaluate even more integrals in questions 1c, 1d, and 1e. This is a classic engineering exam question where one question will have like multiple parts. You saw here we had 1a, b, c, d, and e. The reason I think the exam was structured like this by the professor is because there are so many concepts and there are so many methods we can use to integrate, and so I'm guessing she just wanted to test us on as many ways as possible. But anyways, looking at my solution for question 1c and 1d, you'll notice I label step 1 and step 2 as well as my final answer. The reason I did this is because the solution to this question is a little long and when I'm organized with my work, I'm less prone to making silly mistakes. It also makes the grader more likely to give me part marks if my final answer isn't entirely correct. And in engineering, we live off part marks. Again, moving on to part 1e, you'll notice I always label my steps, have a little explanation of what I'm doing, and box my final answer. Sometimes if I'm in a rush, I won't do that, but this was the first question, so I had enough time to do that. Let's move on to the second and third question where I had to use two rules that we learned in class. In particular, I use the trapezoid rule and what's called the appropriate error bound formula to solve this question. Again, I always like to number my steps as you see here. Now on to question four, we move on from integrals and I get asked to solve this particular differential equation. This is the particular differential equation I have to solve. If you don't know what differential equations are, this may look confusing, but really there's just an algorithm that you have to follow in order to solve the equation. The same applies to question five. So it may look a little complicated, but trust me, it's a lot easier than it looks. Now moving on to question six, it makes me use this concept called limits. And again, when I'm solving this question here, I'm always trying my best to make my work clear. So I use arrows to showcase my workflow and I always box or underline my final answer. And in general, alongside the math that I'm doing, I always try to use words to kind of explain what it is I'm doing and where I got certain equations from. As you can see right here, I have a little explanation of what it is that I'm doing, but I actually lost some marks in this question because I didn't fully explain every single step. Finally, in this exam, we move on to question seven, which contains parts A, B, C, and D. This particular question gives us a sequence of numbers. And in simple terms, a sequence of numbers in this question is defined using these two equations. And we have to do a bunch of proofs in parts A, B, and C. Then in part D, I'm asked to find the limit. Notice how I very clearly try to label my steps, and I usually also like to include therefore statements. You'll notice that some of the math in this exam can actually seem to be a little complicated, but we're taught all these different algorithms and different methods to solve these questions, so it's a little simpler than it may look. However, it's really important to be really good at algebraic manipulation because that's something that every course in engineering uses, especially calculus, as you can see right here. This exam was worth 43 marks and we had roughly 120 minutes to finish it. So in order to make sure I finish it on time, I took 120 minutes divided by 43 marks, which means I need to spend roughly two and a half minutes for every mark on the exam. For example, question two was worth four marks, so I make sure to spend roughly no more than 10 minutes on it. That way I make sure to finish the exam on time. Out of the 43 marks on the exam, I got 38.5 out of 43, which roughly equates to 89.5%. The class average was around 68%, and this is how other students in my class scored. As you can see, most people scored between 65 to 90%. Again, I'm being fully transparent about grades and engineering because this is something that I wish I would have known when I was first starting out. I also think that transparency helps to figure out what is truly possible. It was definitely a challenging course, but a lot of people were able to get perfect scores on this exam. But you may be wondering how. How were you able to score so high on this exam? How are people able to get perfect score? And the simple answer is practice. You're not bad at math, you're not bad at calculus. If you struggle with these courses, it's because you just haven't done enough practice. Practice was especially important for this course. 
because right here I have a past exam for this particular course. This is like a review sheet that I did before the actual exam. And you notice the questions on this review sheet were very, very similar to the questions on the final exam. Let's look at them side by side. So obviously the questions were overall different, but they're actually really similar in terms of the concepts that we had to use. You can see right here the first page is structured the same way. Moving on, the second page is also the same way. We have part C, we have part D. Then moving on, we have part 1E. And moving on, question 2 and question 3 are very similar. Like, come on, it's actually insane how these questions have a very similar structure. And if you were able to do the review sheet and practice it enough time, the exam would have been an absolute breeze. So basically, if I can solve this practice review exam without an issue, then walking into the Mitchum exam, I'd feel really confident. Next, let's have a look at this third year thermodynamics course that I took. It's one of the fundamental courses in mechanical engineering. Luckily for this exam, I was allowed to bring a cheat sheet and this is what my cheat sheet looked like. It contained all the information I needed to be able to answer the exam questions. I boxed all the important equations in red and divided each section into blocks with colored dashed lines. I also have diagrams as you can see here and flow charts as you can see here because I find visuals help me learn better and when I'm frantically looking for something on my cheat sheet during the exam, mind maps, flow charts, box equations, and diagrams make it very easy to find. I was allowed to bring a calculator to the exam, which was nice. The exam was two hours long, it had three questions, and was worth a total of 30 marks. Each of these three questions were worth about the same, so I aimed to spend about 40 minutes per question on the exam. That way, I made sure to finish on time. For the first question, we're given this thermodynamic system that contains a bunch of machines like turbines and pumps. We're told that the pressure and temperature changes throughout the system, so we're asked to find a bunch of things including temperatures, pressures, and energy at different points throughout the system. This is a very long solution, and I'm not going to bore you with the details, but here are four takeaways that you should keep in mind when you're doing long exam questions like this. First, always say your assumptions because almost every engineering question has assumptions that you need to make. Second, draw a label diagram of what's going on in the question so you better understand it. Third, for your solution, it's always good practice to label and number all your steps, especially when the question is this long. Fourth, you'll notice that this question had four parts, A, B, C, and D. So I make sure to box or double underline the answer for every part. This particular question was worth 12 marks, but I ended up scoring 10 out of 12 on it, even though I made quite a few mistakes in this question. But because I showed my work, I didn't lose as many marks because they were able to kind of figure out where I messed up on and realize it was just a silly mistake that I made. For example, here my solution for this particular line right here, I wrote S4 minus S1, but the correct answer was actually S1 minus S4. If I had skipped that line, I probably would have lost more marks since it would have been more difficult for the grader to know what I got wrong. So this shows the importance of showing your work very clearly. Let's move on to question two. It's sort of similar to question one in the way that I solve it and show my work. As you can see, I really like numbering my steps, describing briefly what I'm doing and stating all my assumptions. For this particular question, we're told that we have nitrogen in a compressor and we need to find the work and the exergy destroyed. The terms I just mentioned may be new to you and it may seem really complicated at first, but again, once you take this course and learn all the different methods and algorithms you can use to solve this thermodynamic system, it will make a lot more sense to you. Finally, we have question three, which has a very similar approach to the last two questions. We're given this thermodynamic system and based on the temperatures and pressures at different points, we need to find the flow rate and input power. Out of the 30 marks available for this test, I scored 27.5, which roughly equates to 91.7%. The average was 71% and this was how all other students in my class performed on this exam. Surprisingly, quite a few people got a perfect score. Now let's have a look at my control systems exam. This course teaches us the laws that govern the mechanical, electrical, thermal, and fluid control components. The exam was two hours long and was worth a total of 100 marks. This meant that I should spend about one minute for every mark. The first question was worth about 30 marks, so I had to make sure I spent roughly 30 minutes on it. One of the biggest problems that I found with this course is for you to do well in it, you need to be able to see the bigger picture of the entire course. So what that means is the entire course doesn't fully start to make sense until the end. Because everything starts clicking when you realize how all these different topics are actually related to each other. But luckily for me, this course allowed us to bring a cheat sheet to the exam. This is what mine looked like and it allowed me to see the bigger picture of the entire course. I included all the useful diagrams and I boxed all the important equations in green as you can see right here. Let's have a look at the first question of this exam. The first question gives us this mass spring system and asks us to represent the system with a bunch of different equations. In simple terms, you have a mass spring system whenever you have a mass attached to a spring. 
Common examples include shocks or suspension in a car, or springs in a mattress, or even the spring mechanism that we have in guns. So the equation that I use to represent the particular example in this question can actually be used to represent some of these real life examples. Now the solution to this question is actually pretty long, but I solve it by breaking down the question into its components and trying my best to label my steps and describe what I'm doing and where the equations are coming from. This exam was definitely not as organized as I wanted it to be, but the exam was pretty long, so I really had to rush a lot. As you can see, the solution was about two pages long. Now let's have a look at the second question of the exam. The second question was similar to the first question in that I had to do some math again to represent this mass spring system in terms of its equation. This is what my solution looked like. It was a relatively long solution taking about a page and a half. Let's move on to question 3, but before showing you what this question looks like, some of these professors like to be very creative with how they give us these kind of confusing problems. Here we were given this weird contraption where we had a cart attached to springs and a pendulum, and we had to represent this whole system with equations. The solution was about two and a half pages, so at this point in the exam, I was really rushing to finish. Now let's move on and have a look at the fourth and final question of this exam. This question asks us to determine which of these equations on the right represents the graph on the left. The way I solved this is by explaining what each equation meant and how they related to the graphs given. Out of the 100 marks available for this test, I got 90% and the overall average for this exam was 74%. And this was how all the other students in my class performed on this exam. Surprisingly, a lot of people scored near perfect scores. Again, the reason I'm sharing all these grades and all these numbers with you is because in engineering it's a very common stereotype to say that all engineers get 60s, but as you can see, it's not true. We have engineers all over the spectrum. And it truly is possible to score well in engineering. But that's it, these were three of my hundreds of engineering exams that I did in my undergrad. If you want to see more of my engineering exams, check out this video and I'll see you in the next one. Peace!